Well, is Madonna used in one of her albums? Whoops, I did it again. So for my fans who like my observations about restoring a Lynn LP-12, and for those who didn't, um, I, I've got another one, and this one's actually older um, than the one I tried to update. We're not going to be updating this one. Uh, it You can tell by the old power switch. Uh, this is what was called pre-Valhalla. The table was brought in to us for two complaints. One, that the platter wasn't spinning at all, and two, that he was getting no sound from the cartridge, if he, if he could get the platter to spin. And we've had this table in the store before, and I'm going through it, and we did the basic testing. The power switch itself is what's ultimately failing. Um, as long as you do it with authority and make the contact, she comes up. The power supply is that little board, like I told you, showed you last time. And uh, they don't fail like the Valhalla's because you don't have uh, capacitors that essentially, you know, meet the kiss of death or other small capacitors on the board that need to be resoldered because the solder points have actually fractured. We'll get into repairing a Valhalla board. I'll show you what that is later in another video. But while we had the table in our hands, there were certain things that became very obvious. And there was one thing I haven't talked about before, and I'm going to bring it out. And it's a tool we have supplied by Lynn. And for those who want to do Lynn LP12s at their home and think they can understand how to get the bounce right, well, I'm going to give you a nightmare. So let's get into this table as it is. Older tables uh, are typically mishandled in terms of where, literally, where you can put your fingers on it. And one of the most critical parts in that is where the platter itself meets the inner platter. Now, the platter itself is lacquered, top and bottom. This one's you know, showing her age. But this surface here is not lacquered, nor is its mating surface lacquered. And under the light, if you look at it, you're going to see things like fingerprints because they decided to hold it like this and carry it. And the finger oils have started to cause all sorts of lovely little problems on the surface, which means its coupling to the inner platter is being undermined. All is not lost. I'll show you one of the things that we did uh, with the uh, aid of audiophile systems and how to deal with it. Uh, the inner platter has a couple spots on it that um, this one in particular um, looks like it's really starting to rot. So we got to fix that. The So we're going to do that first, and then I'm going to put the table up on a jig and then show you a nightmare. So what we're going to use is something that is used to clean Lynn styluses if you're using a Lynn cartridge. And the reason you can do that with Lynn cartridges is that the diamond is actually punched through the cantilever, not glued on like Shore's, uh, which is why if you bumped a Shore cartridge sideways, you always rip the stylus off. Shore made a lot of money with the M91ED. I sold so many style and it was nuts. So what I have is an extremely fine aluminum oxide sandpaper, and I'm gonna come into this surface and literally start sanding it because I've gotta get all those oxidation points off of it. I'm using one finger and I'm just simply gonna work my way around. And I've gotta clean off all of the oxidation points caused by typically finger oil, more than anything else, that's interfering with it mating to the inner platter. 
I don't recommend the use of anything more aggressive because you really don't want to create ridges and gouges in this surface, which basically undermines and defeats the very reason you're trying to clean it up. And you can look at it in the light. I've got light at my angle where I can see where the oxidation is. And I'm going right at it. On this one, you can't see it, but out on the outer edge of this, you can really see where the fingers were used to grip it. Once that's done, I don't use a chemical. I just simply grab a paper towel and wipe away any of the remaining um, shards or whatever we want to call it of the metal itself so that I've got this so that it's shiny and meets the surface properly. When we're looking at the inner platter, we have the same thing potentially going on here. As I said, this spot here is real bad. You should not attempt to sand this surface with the inner platter in the bearing well, because now you're putting additional force and stress into that area, and that's not really ideal. So I take the belt off, Gonna take my paper towel because I don't know what oil this one has. All right, here we have an older bearing. There's the white sleeve I talked about before. Rather than the clear oil, we've actually drained that in a prior visit and used the Lynn graphite oil. And it's not going anywhere. So now I can start looking at this inner platter and I'm gonna go right after um, let's see if you can get a really good picture of that. The really bad spot. And that's just simply no good. So that's got to come out. If you do this, you know, I, I hold the inner platter against my chest um, so that I have control. I don't set it on any surface. I don't want to risk um, dinging or putting a dent into anything. And I'm just going to work out all of those oxidated points so that I have it smooth again. And this pitting here is about as substantial as I see when I try to um, resuscitate um, plated silver where the lower surface um, is just coming through. So I'm gonna apply a little bit more pressure, being very careful not to disturb the areas that are in fact lacquered. And I'm gonna to have to go back at this spot because it is quite substantial. Again, paper towel, I'm gonna to go in, wipe it off. The oil is behaving itself, thank you very much. And I'm gonna go around, clean it off, take a look at my work, and do a little more. For those who don't know much about um, Lynn and their dedication to doing things right. Uh, their platters, and you see here's an older bearing where it takes a long time to bleed in. Their platters are milled over a three day period and they're checked for defects as they do it. They're not something that's you know stamped aluminum cast out and then maybe somebody puts a drill on it and puts a hole in it to try to balance it. 
and the same thing is done with the inner platter. It, it's done with a lot of care and precision. <coughs> Things are not on Lynn turntables because they thought they would look cool. They're on Lynn turntables because they have a purpose. I'll give them a lot of credit for that sort of attitude. So give me a moment, I'm gonna let this settle down. I'm gonna wash my hands with the metal on it and I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. And for those who watched my earlier video about how I felt working on really Lynn turn, old Lynn turntables, um, yes, I left my 45 at home, otherwise I might've used it on myself. I'm glad some people enjoyed that line because it was all in jest, folks. Now, with all their turntables or even general maintenance on your turntable, you have to understand that when things are in a spinning motion, um, like a, um, a tornado or a hurricane, the tendency is to pull everything towards the center. This, it is true for um, the motor pulley as well as the uh, surface of the inner platter. And so what happens is dust and dirt gets sucked in and ground in underneath the belt. So it's not a bad idea every couple of years um, to take your belt off and to wash it in soap. Now you don't want to use anything with lanolin or, you know, eucalyptus or anything like that, just soap and wash the belt. And you'll oftentimes find that it's coming off a little dirty and that's what's happened is the dirt has ground itself into the belt. And that reduces its gripping power. I also take the time with the motor pulley because rubber will stick to things, is to take the time and clean the pulley itself. So here we have the results of uh, some of the pulley. This is a pulley here. Um, cleaning it off so that it is smooth like it should be originally. And uh, this one is actually a different one for a second. We'll get to him. So I'm cleaning that off and then I take the time they clean this surface here, but very carefully because this is a lacquered surface in the bottom edge. So you don't want to use any chemical on it because you'll risk ripping the lacquer off. Then you get into the pitting problem and then you get into the sanding. And then if you think you can lacquer it yourself, well, good luck. So you'd be very careful about this surface in particular. But I have seen where um, this tube has become pitted. Um, this one isn't uh, yet and um, if it is pitted then there you go with aluminum oxide sandpaper and if you want to try to lacquer it without screwing anything else up well try your hand at it so we've figured out that the switch is slowly going ha happily i have a couple older ones that i may throw on this one i'll test it a bit further and i've taken the time now to get the mating surfaces correct I have a belt that I'm going to inspect both sides. A bit of an argument about this one, actually, because um, as you squeeze a true Lynn belt, um, you'll see one side actually shows like it has cracks in it and the other side is very smooth. And there's been kind of this running debate as whether the smooth side, smooth side should be in or the side that shows like it has like these little cracks in it. Um, for its ability to grip. And I've heard uh, instructions to do it one way and then instructions to do another. If you want to flip your belt and listen to it, okay. So now we've done all this. And he's bought an aftermarket felt mat that has whatever to it. I don't know what it's made out of, but um, it's fairly slick. I'm not so sure that it's a good idea, but it's not my turntable. And maybe someday I'll listen to the difference between this mat and others. People play with mats, and that's okay. Now, the other thing you typically run into on in older turntables is the, ne the need to look at the RCAs themselves. If they've been plugged or unplugged a lot of times, what you should use is a contact cleaner. Uh, I don't know so much about enhancers, 
as much as just getting a decent cleaner and get in there with a Q-tip that you've stripped down and go around the inside. You're also getting the center post and stripping off all of the garbage that's sitting in there that has nothing to do with electrical contact, but everything to do with interfering with it. Um, I'm not going to waste my time showing you how to spray a Q-tip, but just get yourself a respectable chemical cleaner. The only thing I'd caution some people on is to make sure that you're not getting one that is so aggressive that it actually melts the plastic. Um, there are some spray contact cleaners out there that'll do just that. Well, that's the end of that stuff. Now, everybody's told about the Lin Bounce, that it has to bounce the right way. I recently watched a couple of videos and I'm sorry, I'm not really cute to look at. And um, so I, I came to look at this one and very quickly, you know, when you're dinking it, you can see the things are all screwed up. I'm gonna give you an overhead shot to show you a bit of what's going on because looking at it from the side only tells you part of the story. And what I want you to do is to pay particular attention to this corner here and watch what happens because it doesn't bounce up and down. It jiggles and wobbles, okay? So this thing is completely screwed up in the bounce. And I don't care where I bounce or how I try to bounce it. It's a mess. I'll be quiet. You can actually hear the spring squeak. That shouldn't be happening either. So I've got to go in and do the suspension on this turntable. And so I'm going to put it up on a jig and then I'm going to release my most terrifying tool. Now, as I said before, you can identify an older Lin LP12, a real old one, by the use of the silver uh, bolts. But you have to respect the fact that the top plate is stainless steel and should be properly secured in all four corners. And looky, looky, this thing is bowed wrong. This can occur by too much tension uh, on these screws here. It can also you know, naturally happen over time. But that now resonates. And so we have a problem. Up on the jig she goes. The other cues to tell you it's an old LP12, particularly an old base, is here we have the slot that held uh, the bracing part, part to keep the lid up. That's a dead giveaway there. The smoothness of the base all in the backside is a bit of a giveaway. The Armboard itself is painted. It's not laminated. And that's another real dead giveaway. And that's one of the first things that ultimately should be replaced. We're not doing that. But I want to get into this table to show you how a lot of people who think they're doing the bounce right are not. Okay, so if you look at the plinth, and then you look at the stainless steel top plate, you can see the bow, and that shouldn't be there. So if this table is gonna be done properly, what I have to do now is another table I need to take down to pieces so that I have only the top plate to work with, and I have to carefully apply pressure to this and literally bend it back so that it is in proper position. So uh, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk to the owner about it because now we're just not doing it a little tuna for an inexpensive amount of money because now I'm needing to labor. But this gives me an opportunity to point out something that most of you don't have. I know your hobbyists don't have it because this is a tool that was given by Lynn Hi-Fi in training. And I'll show you how it's used. That's great. Let's pull a pen out and flash it up there as if I'm going to see light. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start looking at this. Here's a little power supply that just simply doesn't create any problems. 
There we have the old bearing cap, the white one, you know, the washing machine sound. Right now, this motor's quiet. If your motor's quiet, don't screw with it. You'll regret it. But while this is a newer board, because you can see the glue to it, as opposed to the welds, look at all of this. We got rust and shit going on. And um, so, obviously in very high humidity, and maybe that has something to do with the switch failure in its contacts because we got humidity screwing things up. Um, ideally, I don't see this where we have a ground cable that's actually banging on the sub chassis. But, you know, that's an easy fix. You just bend it into place and you're done with it. But here we go. Um, we're going to take a military nut off. You can see we have an old washer because it's silver. I don't think there's any difference between the silver and the black other than it tells you what the vintage is. But down I come. Since we know that the balance is all screwed up, I'm really not too worried. The balance is all screwed up. I'm not too worried about what I'm causing here because I've got to go into it anyway. These were recently replaced in the last three or four years. Uh, as were the springs. So they're fairly current, but to hear that squeaking going on tells me a lot about how things are just not in tune. Okay, folks, here's the nightmare. Here's the tool you don't have. So anybody who thinks they can tune a Lin LP12, and this is also true for the Thorins, because they use the same, same type of suspension, what you don't have. If you look at this tool, you will see that it, is, it looks to be a simple bubble balance. And it's more than that because, and I haven't leveled the platform out yet. I haven't made sure that um, the table itself is absolutely level. But if this top plate can bend and flex, what makes you think that if you're going to try to tune perpendicularly that the bolts are straight, perpendicular to the surface. You're assuming that. The purpose of this tool is to go up that shaft and start measuring it. Okay? So I see it's slightly off. So for giggles, I'm going to stop and make sure the platform is level. And we're going to take a look at this. So before we can see what's going on with the bolts... We first take the time to make sure our jig is level, uh, front to back, side to side. They have leveling feet. So you can check, make sure the platform is fine. I also take the extra precaution of actually testing the plinth of the LP12 to make sure that bubble is centered in both directions again. I'm satisfied. So now we go in with the tool to see what is going on with the shaft of the bolt and is it truly level. And as you can see, we're slightly off. And from this angle, we could be potentially slightly off. Now there's a little play in this. So what you do is you wiggle it back and forth. So you have a double stripe. So you can see where that bubble goes. So this one is slightly off to one side, front to back. Again, it is off, and that's because it has gotten out of shape because what has happened to the top plate. Um, you know, if, if the bolt is bent, then the reaction of your springs is not gonna be perfectly up and down. And so your tuning isn't going to be exactly right. Uh, there are a couple really, really fine dealers in this country um, who work on Lin LP12s religiously. Um, there's one out um, in Colorado. There's another one up in Michigan. And uh, I can't speak for any other parts of the country because I, well, I, most of the good dealers don't exist anymore. Uh, but I know these two guys, you know, are really have it screwed and glued. But this is the sort of thing that when you see 
uh, an older turntable, what's going on and how good can you get it? So I'll have to ask the guy, does he want me to address this resonance, which is, which is not good, and um, which is going to cost him more, whether he just wants to play it for what it is, and I don't have a problem with that. Uh, he has a Grado cartridge on it um, that he got someplace else. And um, when we listened to it earlier, I could barely recognize it as a Lin LP-12 because it really did not um, have any life to it at all. It, it just kind of laid there dead. And, and that is not solely a function of a sub-chassis being out of tune. So I'm just going to push this thing back into position for the moment uh, and safely secure everything and let the customer know what I found, what his choices are. It's his money. Um, trust me, I really didn't want to get into another Lin LP-12, particularly a vintage one, but here we are. And when you're dealing with these older boards, uh, the onboard themselves... Uh, whether the screws are really properly holding it is questionable. Whether the bolts holding it to the armboard itself actually have the proper intention, tension is pretty doubtful. Um, the step from here was a, a dual laminated board, and you wanted it to have it well enough in, in tightness um, just before you cracked um, the lamination on the bottom side. So there's there, there's just kind of this running story. There's... There's tighten, then there's lint tighten, and there's broke. But again, um, while pe some people consider the lint LP12 a, a pain in the ass um, in, in terms of what you need to do, uh, I appreciate all the thought of, that went into it and why you do the things you do. And uh, the other reason that people don't realize that the turntables they have uh, are as much a pain in the ass is because the manufacturer has never taught them how to get the best out performance out of the turntable that your customer purchased from you. And that's an obligation of the dealer to care about his customer and to make sure that what he paid, he's really getting everything it can do. And, um, you know, so I see more and more... Um, turntables out there um, being sold mail order as, as if they're turnkey plug and plays and I see it with Riga, I see it with all sorts of tables and they're not. Uh, I guess you get some performance out of it and it might be pretty good but there's a reason that a lot of these tables were sold through uh, trained dealerships so that you could get every inch of uh, uh, every pound of, of, of money that you paid for. And um, over time, things can go wrong. Keep in mind that this table is probably from the early 80s. And um, so she served their masters well. I, I don't quibble with that. But these sort of things go wrong. And it's just a question of whether you really want to restore it up or just live with what you have. But if you're buying a new, new turntable and you're mail ordering it, Man, you're just winging it um, because most tables that I see out of the box, there's something I can always make sure that is brought back to factory, which should be factory spec. And um, it can be bearing bolts or, or the lock nuts. It can be the screws and the tone arm. Uh, it could be something as simple as the screws that are holding the hinges on, so that's not allowing that to chatter around. All sorts of silly little things. But we know, and um, the people who sell it to you in mail order, um, you know, the only thing that they're interested in is your credit card number, your SIC code, expiration, your name, and your address, so they can just put the box on the FedEx truck and let them beat the shit out of it before you get it. And that's it. They don't care. No. That's why they're small independents like us. So hopefully you take the time to stop by Audible Elegance in Cincinnati. Um, Enjoy the knowledge. I'm in here every uh, couple Saturdays, so um, I enjoy talking with people about their things and, um, you know, share with the knowledge that I have. But uh, that's why we're here. And 
hopefully we can continue to get the lovely support we have had over the years. So thank you again.